everybody welcome to journey with jess i'm your host jessica monge and welcome back to episode number two with monica sorry i had to split up in two parts it was very long but so so informative and so so exciting talking to monica i feel like i could talk to her for ages and this was our first time ever having a conversation so if you didn't listen to the first episode you're going to want to go back and listen to that and her experience growing up in a latin household and how that affected her mental health growing up this part is a continuation. We're going to be talking about her mental health and being a teacher in the States. If you haven't listened to the first one, go back and listen and come back to this one. You're not going to want to miss a second of it. So without any further ado, this is Monica. Thank you for listening to Journey with Jess. Let's talk about that, right? Like, how is your mental health as a teacher right now? Well, right now I'm on summer break, so it's great. <laughs> <laughs> now you're chilling. Now you're, that's right good. Now I'm, I'm so chill. happy for you. <laughs> but you've been teaching for so long like yeah I I don't know I've worked with kids since 2009 when I was volunteering at a elementary school and then in the classroom as the main teacher since 2016 it's wild how different my mental health is during the school year versus during summer vacation which like and I've talked to a lot of my my friends that are also educators I personally think like it would be to everyone's benefit if we were in a year-long sis- educational system rather than the what we currently do which is like nine and a half months of intense all the time working teaching and then the two months two and a half months of of summer school for myself and for a lot of educators not not everybody but but for myself it's always a shock like to my body and to Mm. just like my my everyday regulation in both ends when we get out of summer school and it's like okay right now I have all the time in the world I can do whatever the heck I want when I want (laughs) sleep in have a a scheduled podcast interview um (laughs) you know, do whatever. But during the school year, it's like, no, I have to be at work Monday through Friday from this time to this time and plus an hour or two before and after to then Mm -hmm. like prep and and, um, get everything ready for the following day. Plus the added stress of like, okay, I am also now interacting with 24 children that are not mine. I, I don't have any kids, but, but, you know, just like I have no actual connection, like, familial connection to these kids and these 24 students are coming from 24 families that are coming from 24 backgrounds that Mm -hmm. are you know each uniquely want to address things in a very different way we're in such a teacher shortage you know advocating for students to get the support that they need for students who have like a 504 IEP anything that requires them to get minutes with like a paraprofessional but then we're in such a shortage that it's like okay now I'm also having to like be an advocate for the five kids in my classroom that are not receiving the minutes that they deserve, that they are legally entitled to. And then just trying to like also teach families how to advocate for their kids. Because if I complain as the teacher, if I put in these things, not much is going to happen. However, if the parents say something, then more things can get into motion faster at least. And so there's just like so many hats that you're wearing during the school year of like, I'm, I'm the teacher, I'm a counselor, I am helping train parents sometimes with, with certain things. Like teaching is just such a, teaching in the US, teaching in the US. Because when, <laughs> when I was in Sweden, um, I was there for, like I said, it was going to be a program that was related to, to my major. Their school day is like half as long. I want to say it's like four hours. And oh, wow. And they do so well with like understanding of the material testing and all those other metrics that are used on a global scale. But part of the reason that teachers or like students are so successful and teachers are so happy is that within the workday, there's also like planning time versus here in the US, especially in a public school system. The school day is about six hours. We have one hour of prep. Mm-hmm. But like thinking of elementary school specifically, I have to teach all subjects. I teach right. math, social studies, uh, reading, writing. Um, depending on your school, you might also be teaching PE as well. I have to be prepared to teach all five of those subjects. Oh, and mm-hmm. science. I'm already forgetting what I have to teach. Um, <laughs> and science. And so it's like each of those subjects has their own curriculum. I am one person. I have to be well-versed and familiar with everything that I have to teach 
those 24 kids who have 24 different learning styles for the entire day and then the next day and the next day and the next day. And it's like, how much time am I given to actually prepare for that? Less than one hour every day within my work day, within my work day. So usually I'll, I'll be there at least two more hours from my contract hours, either one hour before school or like the two hours after school. But it really leads to a very like unbalanced life of, of just like, okay, if I'm putting all that time and energy into my work, what am I doing with my sleep? What am I doing with my mm-hmm. exercise? How am I nourishing myself? And so it's like, okay, now I have to like plan even more things. <laughs> like I've got to, got to schedule yeah. it and I've got to put it in my Google calendar. I've got to like meal prep or, or whatever. And then if I miss just one thing, then it's just like this whole domino effect of, of being all over of like, oh, I didn't pack my lunch. Now I'm hungry. Now I'm at school and I haven't eaten. And yeah. depending on where your school is, um, luckily I am, I'm in a city. So times where that has happened, I can like, uber eats or doordash or or whatever Mm -hmm. um or or just eat the cafeteria food that the kids are like this Mm -hmm. is disgusting and i'm like it's calories (laughs) (laughs) it'll do for now it'll do for now but it's so opposite when when we're in the school year i'm just like just like i have a thousand things going on in my head at all times and always just thinking about all these other things and i just can't really like shut it off. And it just requires so much discipline to be able to be like, no, my workday ended. Mm. Even though I didn't finish grading those papers, even though I didn't, you know, finish prepping for the next day, I have to walk away. Like this past year, I was I was a union rep for for my site. And and I was trying to be like that advocate for other people as well of just like, hey, no, it's your lunch. Like, you can't have that meeting right now. Don't Mm. Don't give up your um, duty-free lunch to go have a meeting with the principal right now. Right. Absolutely not. <laughs> Just like let, let allow me to help advocate for you, but then and then that adds on to the other roles of like me during the school year. Is like yeah, that's so much. And I'm a union rep, so yeah. So I I think like if we, I feel like we need to just totally restructure education in in so many ways. Like I think the school day should be shorter, mm. like the the actual time that the kids are supposed to be like in the desk doing work, whatever. I think it should be shorter. They're seated for way too long for their little bodies. And I think it's ridiculous that some districts also have like kindergarten students doing whole school days instead of half, instead of half school days. Because I can't just just think about that. Like how ridiculous does that sound? Okay. These five-year-olds are expected to be at school for six hours doing those same things, all those same subjects and stuff. Granted, they'll do it in like shorter bursts and they'll have like a couple other things of like play or whatever. Mm -hmm. But that's if the teacher values that and sees that it's important for students to also have some of that free play and uh, exploration time, but not everybody does. We are a um, country that values uh, testing so much right. and puts a lot of pressure on that. Like, I think it's wild that we are expecting five-year-olds to also read um, mm. by the end of the school year. It's just developmentally not appropriate. And and I was very blown away when I was in Sweden that they don't actually like formally teach or granted Sweden, don't misquote me on this. <laughs> don't quote <laughs> me on this. Um, don't know how many viewers you have in Sweden. But but when I was there that like they said that they don't really like formally expect students to be like reading, reading until they're seven. And it's oh, because wow. of, like the where their brains are at by that point. And um and that's why over here in the US, you'll see a lot of students make major growth and major jumps in their in their reading abilities in second grade or first and second grade because usually that's when students are about seven years old and their brain is able to make those connections and able to grasp and understand the the concept of like what are the letters doing when they're pushed together and how how do you read it how do you make um sense of it all it's just wild how because like when i was in kindergarten i i don't remember that we were expected to read there was definitely a lot of reading done with us like read alouds and like learning our letters and learning sounds but the expectation of us like reading a a level a or b book by the end of kindergarten Mm -hmm. i i don't recall that at all um but yeah no i i think i think like the school day should be shorter I think um, part of the work hours for teachers should, we should have a minimum of two hours of prep for the next day. 
minimum, if not more for elementary education versus like teachers who teach single subject because they're only prepping for one subject or maybe two, like within that same realm, like for high school, I'm sure math teachers are teaching multiple levels of math, but they're teaching like just math. (laughs) Right. Yeah. And it's just, you know, and, and all teachers everywhere are like, yeah, we need more prep time. We need more time to give meaningful feedback to students. Um, and then with the school year being like the way it is right now, I think it would make way more sense for us to be a calendar year type of thing or full year. So that way kids also don't have the summer slide. Like summer break is great for everyone. Like everybody gets a, a break from all that rigor, but for the students who um, are struggling or who don't necessarily have as much support at home to help them, they end up stagnating and they end up sliding back um, a bit with their skills and whatnot because unfortunately, like for the kids in those situations, they're not being engaged. Like it's more telephone, tablet, TV, and mm-hmm. and just like, we need you kind of just there. Like, I just need to know that you're at the house and you're okay. Yeah. And and it's understandable too, because a lot of those kids are coming from like working class families that they just can't afford to put them in a summer camp or put them in a tutoring program or, right. or hire somebody to be like the nanny or whatever yeah. to to interact with them. And And it's just so unfortunate that there's all these like systemic things that as a teacher... Mm. The pressure is put on us to make up for all of these faults in a larger system Mm -hmm. that we do not have control over. I just have control over what happens in my classroom for six hours. And even then, that's not that much. (laughs) (laughs) No, it's not. So going back, how is your mental health? How are you doing? I'm okay right now. Um, It's... Teaching has been really rough these past couple of years, especially with COVID and teaching online. Um, as I mentioned earlier, I was teaching kindergarten when we were like fully on Zoom when we were remote. Oh. In fact, like this was one of my backgrounds. And, and then mm. I had another corner of my studio apartment. Like there, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, let me make it look like something else. Let me let it, oh. make it look interesting. During the school year, it's, it's hard. Unfortunately, it's feeling really abysmal to be an educator in public schools because we are not given the respect that we deserve as a profession, you know, in general, people tend to see it as like, oh, it's just childcare, you know, like we're not doing anything that's all that complicated. Um, it's so complicated for you guys. <laughs> like, I know, like, uh, like you said, you have paras in your room sometimes or at least you advocate for it. I'm a um, registered behavior technician. So sometimes I go into schools to do one on one. Um, and at least those rooms have TAs. I can't imagine just teachers alone. And I, I had, a, when I grew up, I only had one teacher in the room. Mm-hmm. So like looking back, I'm just like, how did you guys do it all? <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. I mean, it, it's also interesting as an adult to just be like, Hmm, I, I wonder what was like in vogue in education at, when I was a kid. Um, cause like I mentioned, like when I was little, there wasn't that same pressure for kindergartners to, to do the same things that is expected of them present day. The integration of technology mm. wasn't, you know, wasn't something that we, or that I was dealing with until middle school. And even in middle school, it was like, I had a typing class. <laughs> like, yeah. I remember like, those. Uh, how to like put your fingers on the home keys and having yeah. like a little, silicone cover on the keypad so that way we could um cover the letters and memorize how mm-hmm. to type. yeah 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 and so um that was it and and it wasn't until high school and again I opted in to this academy that was all tech-based where mm-hmm. we were using computers more whereas now like my nephew he's he just finished kindergarten and even in his kindergarten classroom this year like they weren't on zoom but they were still using seesaw which is um, a platform that a lot of educators used during the pandemic while teaching from teaching on Zoom. I use a uh, seesaw this past school year and the last school year for some assignments as well because it just allows for like it, it's a nice way to kind of get a quick quick view of where the kids are at, okay. and it's it's a lot more interactive than um, say using Google Classroom. Google Classroom oh. is more 
is handy for like more formal things. So okay. like submitting PowerPoints or submitting Google Docs or oh. other kinds of projects like that. But but even that, even just being like, oh yeah, my fifth graders, they they did these research reports and they made PowerPoint presentations. Like I didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't do that as a kid. But but you know, like we're in the 21st century. So kids need to have these tech skills. And it's wild, like where, where priorities are given, where money goes. Um, and, and as a whole, it's just kind of like, I would rather change the whole system at this point, like where I am with my career, Mm -hmm. where I am with like my thoughts and feelings on being an educator. Like I still love working with kids. I honestly do. It's, Mm -hmm. it's the best part. And, and the reason why I got into education is like, I wanted to have a positive impact on my community, you know, based on what my students tell me, (laughs) like I'm doing that. I'm managing, managing to like, um, help them express themselves. I'm able to create a safe space where they feel like they can be their authentic selves and, um, and that they don't feel like they have to fit a specific mold, you know, going back to the whole thing about feelings. I love (laughs) teaching kids about talking about their feelings. (laughs) Oh, that's awesome. Like, let's, recognize what we're feeling let me let me walk you through my own frustrated feeling like we we use this uh curriculum called uh second step and it's all about like social emotional lessons and stuff I honestly feel like I get the biggest benefit from that I think there, there there are these songs that go along with each like segment or each unit and one of them is like stop name that feeling calm down Mm. so like every time granted again I just finished my seventh year of teaching me being able to walk through my emotions present day is a major improvement from how (laughs) I would like feel so frustrated and just kind of like unable to like express it in my first year of teaching Uh like first year it's just survival first year it's like oh my god (laughs) because like I said those five subjects I gotta like know all Mm. so so to just jump in head first as the solo teacher Mm. and and then just be like oh my god I'm barely knowing this I'm barely knowing that and then on Mm. top of that having to deal with the behavior and the the, yeah and their own traumas like all these kids have their own traumas they have their own backstories they have their own issues with each other they're coming (laughs) (laughs) the beef (laughs) It is so serious. It is like my year oh of thing. I was a I was a fourth grade teacher, and there were these two kids. They they had some serious beef since the third grade. It was wild, and it was pretty serious too. It was like oh wow, racialized. It was also oh. like homophobic. And oh my gosh, and, you know, imagine being your first year on your own, and you're just oh. like, holy <laughs> hell, like what? That's what crazy. do I do? How do I handle this? So obviously I needed a lot of support um, mm. with <laughs> with that. But but you know, it's just like, oh my God, like what what do I do? And when you're in those situations, like kind of feeling that like fight or flight type of thing, like, do I do I yell? Do I raise my voice? Do I oh yeah let it happen? Do I just mm-hmm. or, or like you know, not not just let it happen, but oh, yeah. um like let them sort it out. Um, you know, and it takes time to to be able to understand how like how dysregulation happens and um, how to help guide students towards regulating themselves again or being able to come back from it, from being dysregulated and escalated in, in that situation. Um, and so as far as myself, <laughs> it, it, it was honest, I felt like I benefited from these second step lessons because because now I I will stop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't stop what I'm doing and and you know just kind of give one of those looks of just like you know deep breath like really just like I, I will stop what I'm doing stop what I'm saying because honestly that's way better than than escalating further if, if uh-huh. more stuff's going on and and I will like breathe for a minute the kids will start to notice that I stopped talking and <laughs> they'll, they'll be like shh I feel like that always worked better than the teachers yelling in back in the day too. Yeah. And and then, you know, once once I was able to like get a couple breaths and then it's like, okay, stop, name that feeling. Now I can name it. Now I can be like, 
I'm feeling really frustrated or upset because da 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 da. I know some kids have definitely walked away doing better with their math or reading or whatever. I, I think like one of the biggest values for my students is just being able to like manage their emotions mm. um, coming out of fifth grade, especially coming out of upper elementary and heading into middle school. If there's anything that they're going to take away, I really hope that they take away being able to center themselves and take some of those uh, emotional skills into into middle school with them of being able to be like you know what I don't need to keep arguing with you or I don't need to like get into that person's face about whatever um this is how I'm feeling and you know what I need right now I need to walk away or Mm. I I just need my headphones and need to just like listen to some music, not listen to any of you all for, for a little bit. And then I'll come back. Um, cause, cause yeah, there've been definitely been times where I'm just like, instead of doing what my teachers did, which I do remember some teachers, um, just like turning off the lights. And then that was the signal of like, okay, everybody put put your heads down. I remember that. Um, Yeah. And, and I mean, I get it. That was, that was essentially a way for the teacher to also regulate themselves and the classroom. I personally prefer what I do, which is like, I'm not going to necessarily turn off the lights, but I'll be like, if, if I need that quiet, I'll, I'll tell them that I'll say, you know, I'm, I'm feeling really frustrated because I'm trying to get through this lesson and I'm having to stop every so often for all your interruptions, all these interruptions that are happening. And right now I cannot continue with the lesson. So I need a break. I need it to be silent. I'm going to put music on. You can draw, you can just color or write something Mm. in your notebook or take out a paper, go get some paper, go get some markers, go get whatever you need for the next five minutes. And then Mm. I'll like put a timer on the board. I'll play some soft music. And and then I'll just also be like, and don't talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) And do they usually like, I guess, are better for when the lesson continues? Yeah, they are. Oh, wow. They are. And um, uh, at least this past group that I had, they, they're they super empathetic. I, oh, I even told them, I was just like, I don't normally tell students this, but you guys are my favorite class. <laughs> 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 but it, they were also like kind of the polar opposite of the group I had before that, which like that group, it was rough for a lot of reasons and a lot of needs that I think are not being met with the group that I had the year before. The system itself needs to be revamped and reformatted mm-hmm. and funded. There's no way we're going to serve these students if we don't have adults that are trained and educated in ways to help support students. And we're just trying to like fill holes with whomever we can. It's not um, sustainable. And right. that's why there's just such a huge exodus happening, not only in my district, but in other districts that um, around the country, like no one wants to go into not many people. I shouldn't say no one. Not many people want to go into education as their sole form of income. And and rightfully so. It's very stressful. It's not good pay. People tend to like diminish, but... They tend to have a condescending view of um, educators, especially early ed or preschool. I haven't worked in preschool, but but like they do a whole bunch of other stuff, too, that just is not appreciated for the type of work and skill that is required to be in that setting. And then the people that think it's so simple, so easy, like, okay, sign up to be a substitute. Come sub sub in my class when I'm not here. Cause and that's another thing too. It's just like, who wants to be in that kind of profession where you have to do extra work for a day you're not gonna be here? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> like to to take a day off. Um, like that's why we have to have emergency sub plans for if we're sick, but but even those don't necessarily get used because there's such a sub shortage, there's such a teacher shortage that if we can't get a substitute, all that work, all of those four extra hours you put in to make sure you had stuff for every subject for the next day for the person who was supposed to take care of your class, trash. <laughs> oh no. Get split up. And then they get in, then you we have five kids in a fourth grade room at my next school that I'm going to. My students would be split up between fourth and fifth grade. 10 would go to fifth grade classroom. So five and five. And then four for each of the fourth grade classrooms. So four, four, four. And then the day when I come back, 
they've all done different things. The yeah. kids who were in the fifth grade classrooms, they were most likely still going on pace and whatever, because the fifth grade teachers know what we would normally do. Mm-hmm. But the ones in the fourth grade classrooms, like nobody's handing off the packet or whatever of work yeah, kids to take with them to the fourth grade classroom. And even then, like, it's rough on the teacher receiving those students to be like, okay, where am I going to even put you? Mm-hmm. Do yeah. I have enough chairs? At my first school, we couldn't split with fifth grade. So we would absorb 10 kids each. Our class size would go from 22 to 32 in an instant. I don't know how, how much longer I will stay in public education. I, I don't want to leave it. Mm-hmm. I really don't want to because I, I'm like, I went through public ed. I really enjoy working with the students that I work with. I enjoy working with the population that I work with, which is mostly, since I'm in a dual immersion school, it's mostly like newcomers or similar to myself, first generation students where their parents are the ones who who immigrated over here um, and their families value their kids to have Spanish and English skills for reading, writing, math. And I'm sure I could probably find a, a private school that, would happily pay me more to work with a smaller class size, but okay. There's, there's one more hole. There's one more gap that like the public school district has to now fill similar to the whole, what's it called? Brain drain sim- syndrome of mm, developing. That? Brain drain is like when in developing nations, um, people leave to go get an education somewhere else. And so mm-hmm. they are now a highly educated, highly skilled um, person but then instead of coming back to their home country to help with improving the systems and things of whatever um, profession that they went into, then they end up staying away. And so, oh. so that's, that's the brain drain effect is that you're getting all these highly educated, um, highly skilled people, and, but then they're, you're losing them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like a similar thing essentially is happening or can happen with uh, public education. You Mm -hmm. know, you have all these people who are educated, trained, have experience, but who are burning out because of the systems in place. It's not sustainable. We, you know, as a whole, don't get enough funding for for schools. The fact that schools are funded based on property taxes is ridiculous. Everyone who talks about closing the gap, it's just like, okay, well, then we need to really just like smash the system down. (laughs) And rebuild it. Yeah. Restart. Honestly, we need to restart. We're not being really respected. People can't really afford to um, live off of a teacher income like Mm -hmm. comfortably. You know, I mean, I'm I'm fine, but again, I have no kids. I'm okay with where I'm at. (laughs) If if there was a child in in the equation, I think it would be a different story. Like I would probably need to have a second job or um, Mm -hmm. uh, to to be able to afford like a one bedroom apartment instead of the studio, which is rented below market by my landlord, but that's just out of the kindness of their heart. And this isn't a BMR like city unit. It's, it's just like they purposefully were looking for a teacher uh, with a cat <laughs> <laughs> because they also understand it's like hard for people to find places that accept animals and that teachers don't get paid much. So. Oh, wow. That's so, so nice of them. Yeah, it really is. And, um, and like, that's also why I've stayed here for so long. I, I've been in this, in this uh, studio for four years. It's just because of my current circumstances and, and whatnot. I, if I were to move out to a market rate apartment, I can't afford it. <laughs> just mm. point blank period. I can't. Um, yeah. it, it would most likely be my entire check. And then I would have to like go back to having housemates which like it's they're not that's not too bad but I kind of went from having nine to just me Jeez, <laughs> so, nine is crazy yeah so I, I I just don't think that that's really possible unless I were to leave San Francisco mm. and and even then just the Bay Area is is pretty expensive so I would be taking a pay cut going to um Oh, okay. and to like the district that I grew up in, in Mount Diablo Unified. And, and so, you know, there's just like a lot of things that I've been really thinking about a lot more. And, and so it's not necessarily that like my mental health has gotten any worse. It's just 
I think I'm having to really reevaluate a lot of the the things out of my control. That's a lot that you're going through. And I want to thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for being a teacher. I know the shortage is crazy. I don't have any teacher friends, but I have nurse friends. And I understand like they both don't get equal treatment and like Mm -hmm. it's rough. Um, But we need you guys. And it sucks because you're put in a situation where like, you don't, you don't want to leave your profession, but it's like, what choices do you really have to live like a sustainable lifestyle, you know? Mm Um, so I want to thank you. I do want to end with one final question, bringing uh-huh. it back to your family and stuff. Like, what are your thoughts on generational trauma? And do you feel that you're breaking any generational traumas? <laughs> Such a simple question as the last one. Um, <laughs> at least from what I've seen with, with, with my parents or from, from the outside looking in, can't make the assumption that I know exactly what's going on. Um, but I think just like having better relationships with my siblings, than Mm. what I've seen with my parents and their own siblings. There's a lot of differences between how how we grew up versus how my parents grew up. Like I can't even imagine living in the same household as nine siblings. Granted, I had nine roommates, but that's different. (laughs) (laughs) That's different. We're all more or less around the same age versus nine siblings. That's, you know, and and the span of their age, their ages are are pretty wide. I think um that kind of within itself kind of creates these little clicks within the family unit of Mm -hmm. like the older siblings hanging out more, the middle siblings hanging out more, the younger siblings. Mm -hmm. Um, But then on top of that um, drama over like when my grandmother passed away, Mm -hmm. a lot of conflict seemed to just suddenly come to the surface that again, maybe I just wasn't as aware because I was younger, but a lot of conflict and coming to the surface amongst my tios and tias and my mom. I wonder how long that has that had already been there. And then with my dad, he comes from a blended family. His mom had two kids. Yeah, two kids with a previous marriage. And then together they had three more kids. So I think he has in total five siblings or had five siblings. You know, unfortunately, uh, a lot of my tios and tias have, uh, have already passed away on both sides. Again, just like, you know, there was a part of his life that he didn't even, he didn't have those other siblings with him. So he wasn't necessarily as close to them. And um, even though my brother, sister, and I, we have, um, so I'm 11 years apart from my sister and about five years apart from my brother, even though we're that far apart and, you know, maybe growing up as children, we weren't necessarily super close, or at least I wasn't super close with them. I think they, they were closer. They, they hung out more. Um, uh, as adults, I feel like the three of us have a much healthier relationship amongst us versus what we saw with our, our aunts and uncles on, on either side of our family. And, um, like one of the things that I, I'm just like, damn, is this really like hella Salvadorian or what to just be like, yeah, I I haven't talked to my brother for like 10 years or so crazy. Like, I don't know if you have any kind of experience of that with like either of your parents being like, yeah, I haven't talked to my sister for X amount of years or whatever, but, um, I'm just like, I, I could never, I, I I could never have that. And, and I'm just so happy that we've come to a point for my siblings and I, where it's like that age difference doesn't, doesn't really matter anymore. Um, granted, I'm also like, 32. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so, you know, after a certain point, then it's no longer just like, oh, they're still in their partying era or, or, yeah. or whatever. Um, and, and it's just so, so nice to be able to like confide in my siblings or to call them up. Like just yesterday, I was driving to go visit my parents in Pittsburgh and um, I called my sister and I was just like, what are you doing? No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, And she was getting ready for a, um, actually it was Saturday and she was getting ready for her, um, Ironman relay actually in in upstate upstate New York. Uh, and so, you know, like the three of us will do that. We'll just like randomly call each other or we'll randomly text one another. We, we have multiple group chats, like a group chat with the three of us on Instagram, a group chat with the three of us on Facebook Messenger, and then a group chat of the three of us on, um, on our phones. I feel like that's, that's potentially a a generational trauma that like the three of us are, are breaking the cycle. Um, And, and just like 
I think we, the three of us have also just been better communicators with like our needs, our feelings. See dad, <laughs> it, is important. <laughs> it is important to talk about your feelings. Just being able to be there for one another in those situations. And then also just in general communication, like asking more questions of our parents too. Death is a part of life. I hope my parents are still going to be around for a minimum of like 20 more years, minimum, <laughs> hopefully more. Um, but, but, you know, like they're both retired. Also having seen drama that happened with like the passing of their own parents, of mm. like things not being written down, yeah. things not um, being on paper as far as like who has say over, um, like if they're in a vegetative state, who, what, what are their wishes for that? What is their plan financially for, um, for when they're gone, the, the beneficiaries or, or whatever for those things. Um, not because like my siblings and I are trying to like, be like, oh, we want your money, you know, gimme, gimme type of thing. Yeah. But just like, we don't want to end up having to deal with that yeah. hardship, um, on our own. And or having to figure it out. Cause then like that causes tension and conflict on its own too. Yeah. And that's, that's kind of like what we saw or what I saw with like when my grandmother passed away on my mom's side. And what I saw, what I've seen with some other family members that have passed away, that they didn't put things down in writing. And then mm -hmm. that ended up causing more harm to, to everybody else who was still around. Um, mm -hmm. Because people are fighting over like, this belongs to me, or that belongs to you, or da, 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 da. Yeah. And, and so like, I think um, my siblings and I being very communicative is definitely like breaking a trauma response and trying to break that cycle of what we've seen in the past in our family. That's awesome. That's really great for you guys. I love that for you because it gives me like a lot of hope and faith for my younger siblings. Like yeah. we have a ch uh, chat group text, but it's like, it's different because my brother's 15, my other one's 21 and they're still discovering life while trying to not be so nervous about college. So we're all in a different place in our lives. Mm -hmm. But um, that gives me a lot of faith for when I'm older and they're older. So thanks for sharing that. To wrap it up, What's a piece of advice you'd give to someone listening right now? Even though it's scary, you should push back a little bit more <laughs> with your parents. <laughs> that's great. I, I think that's probably the, the piece of advice that I, I needed to hear. And so even though it's a little scary to confront your parents or maybe ask to have that sleepover or <laughs> go, go somewhere else without them, try and push back a little bit more. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. Because I do have young listeners and stuff. So thank you. Thank you for listening to Journey with Jess. That's it. That's a wrap on our episode with Monica. I hope you learned a lot. I hope you gained a lot of insight. Next week's episode is going to be a therapist. I am so excited. It's my first therapist that I'm interviewing. We're going to be talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart narcissistic parents and as someone who grew up with a narcissistic mother, you know that hits home. I've been following her for a while and you know what i'll leave the rest of the intro for next week if you really like this episode please give a five star rating if you're on youtube please like and subscribe it means the world to me and comment down below what you want to hear next what topics you want discussed and who you want us to guest on the show thanks for listening to journey with jess